And on the crisis thing, the guy said that the entire bait doesn't have to pretend like this is going on. So if we're going to be all bait, we're going to be able to do it. So like, he said, we're going to put it in the box. We're going to put it in the box. Next few days, we're going to put it in the box. Yeah, we're going to put it in the box. 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 I thought they were bringing around a story. It's just all a story. I thought it was a friend. No, I was just like, it was all solid. I don't play it on mine. Like, I play it on my iPad. I think you're not. I think you're not. Oh. <laughs> 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 
it's illegal to make a monkey smoke a cigarette. <laughs> In Maine, you may not step out of an airplane in flight. <laughs> Die, you're going to get <laughs> And while Utah may have the lowest rate of annual alcohol consumption in the country, it also has the highest rate of prescriptions written for antidepressants. <laughs> it's also true that Utah ranked first among all 50 states in the use of narcotic painkillers. <clears throat> Is anybody having fun anymore? Let's look at some other ways society has tried to curb us playing. was arguably the biggest legal failure of the 20th century. This misguided effort to reduce crime, to improve worker productivity, and resolve social problems backfired spectacularly as organized crime exploded, significant tax revenue was lost, and alcohol consumption ultimately increased. By criminalizing the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages, the government created a massive and very lucrative black market. More than a hundred scientific studies have shown that moderate consumption of red wine can have positive effects on our health, assisting in the prevention of even certain cancers. Regular consumption of red wine helps to raise the levels of good cholesterol while lowering levels of bad cholesterol, and can therefore actually help prevent heart attacks and strokes. Multiple studies have shown that in addition to helping prevent heart disease, Regular consumption of red wine can also help reduce the risk of contracting the common cold by as much as 44%. The largest study, the Copenhagen City Heart Study, concluded that, quote, people with no alcohol consumption have a higher total mortality than those drinking one to two drinks a day. Though there are still some countries where it's legally banned, in most cultures of the world, alcohol has become an integral part of what adult members of society incorporate into their play. It's used to toast successes, to cushion the blow of personal failures, to mourn our losses, and to celebrate holidays. Alcohol has also always played an important role as a social lubricator of sorts, in that it lowers inhibitions, thereby allowing ourselves to reveal more about our true selves than we might ordinarily be willing to show. In addition, cocktails can add a magical touch to a romantic interlude or a painfully dull evening. That said, it can also lead to an unplanned new baby <laughs> or to the downward slide of a self-destructive person. But as always, excess must be carefully measured and a crippling hangover is nature's punishment for poor judgment. So if you're avoiding alcohol in a misguided effort to improve your physical or mental health, you might want to reevaluate that decision. A drug, by definition, 
is any chemical introduced into the body that alters the mental state or bodily functions. Therefore, there's no one on this planet in this 21st century who can accurately claim, I don't take drugs. From aspirin to vitamins to Vicodin, we're all guilty of toying with our natural chemistry on an almost daily basis. Any adult is free to purchase beer, coffee, and cigarettes at the corner deli. But a small bag of marijuana for pleasurable consumption can only be purchased through an illegal transaction. The variety of stimulants, barbiturates, narcotics that can be prescribed by a doctor is staggering, while others can only be purchased illicitly. Over the years, laws have been passed, revoked, reinstated, and rethought countless times in a never-ending quest to monitor the endless array of chemicals which we as the public can enjoy. In actuality, much of the advertising can be quite entertaining. Somber voices in television commercials ask probing questions, such as, do you ever feel listless, tired, or uninterested? <laughs> Would you like to be more outgoing at parties? Do your thoughts sometimes wander? If you've fallen victim to any of these terrifying symptoms, you're apparently in deep trouble, and you need to get yourself medical attention very fast. Luckily, there are a variety of Zins and Zacks and Olafs to help you find your way back to the ordinary, everyday world. And all you have to do, it's easy, is just whip out your credit card. Have you noticed that the reassuring TV voice usually trails off slightly at the end of these commercials? Warning that side effects may include diarrhea, constipation, dizziness, nausea, migraines, difficulty urinating, <coughs> searing stomach pains. But these are really very minor issues when you have the opportunity to purchase happiness in pill form. <coughs> The current war on drugs is considered by many to be a misguided attempt of epic proportions by our government to stop us from having fun. We've learned the hard way that it's simply not possible to eradicate the use of drugs. The Dutch government's provided a new model of effective drug reinforcement by regulating them, as opposed to prohibiting them. In the Netherlands, <coughs> drug users are not considered criminals. It's well understood that drug use in and of itself does not lead to crime. But if the supply of drugs is deemed a crime, then the user has to report, to, has to resort to criminal behavior in order to access the drugs. By decriminalizing the drug trade and regulating it, with responsible social programs in place to assume to assist users in trouble, the government has effectively eliminated an entire category of crime. This in turn reduces the burdens on the legal system, the police force, and the prison system. In fact, drug use in the Netherlands has declined and is now significantly lower than in the US and in most other European countries. There's evidence that the tobacco plant began growing as long ago as 6,000 B.C. And history tells us that by 3,000 B.C., the Egyptians had ritualized the burning of herbs and incense used in sacrificial ceremonies. But the earliest indications of the actual practice of tobacco smoking can be traced back to the Mayan and Aztec civilizations in roughly the first century B.C when tobacco was rolled in leaves or stuffed inside bamboo sheets. Christopher 
Columbus was the first European to document the strange and exotic practice as he sailed throughout the Caribbean in 1492. Sensing an opportunity for profit, Europeans soon began to cultivate the new crop, and by the mid-16th century, pipe smoking had become a radical and exotic experience for Europeans. Within the next 100 years, this new fad took hold, and pipe, cigar, and ultimately cigarette smoking became fairly commonplace. By the mid-1800s, commercially manufactured cigarettes were being produced, and tobacco's slow seduction of the masses was well underway. Though the statistical correlation between smoking and cancer was discovered by German scientists as early as the 1930s, the public remained blissfully unaware as they puffed their way through the next several decades. By 1939, it was reported that more than 50% of the American male population smoked. In 1952, the filtered cigarette was introduced as the public began to get wind of these ominous scientific studies, though cigarette companies publicly refuted the evidence of it having any harmful side effects. The supreme irony that cigarette manufacturers advertised their new filtered cigarette as a healthy alternative was only heightened by the fact that the original filters they came up with for cigarettes were made of asbestos. But through it all, the public continued its love affair with cigarettes, not because they were self-destructive, but because they tasted good and they felt good. It wasn't until 1964 that the first Surgeon General's report definitively stating the health hazards of smoking was released. Eventually, the scientific evidence became irrefutable, and smoking did begin to decline, at least in Western Europe and North America. Today, the glamour and pleasure of smoking have been significantly dampened, but for those who do smoke, it's largely an issue of personal freedom. Addiction's clearly part of the picture, but how an individual chooses to deal with his own addiction cannot be legislated. If secondhand smoke is indeed a danger, smokers will just move to the sidewalk. If cigarettes are taxed heavily, somehow they will find the extra money. And if smoking is stigmatized, they'll defiantly hold their ground. Because the bottom line is that human beings seem to love the things that give them pleasure, despite all the health hazards. Even Dr. Phil acknowledges that there is no reality, only perception. In other words, life is what you believe it to be based on your own interpretation. We ascribe meaning to situations, circumstances, experiences. Tragedy can be perceived as opportunity. Loss can be perceived as gain, and so on. This principle is very important to keep in mind when it comes to the subject of money. Money isn't real. It was once when people carried little bags of gold around with them, but now most financial transactions happen electronically without any cash actually changing hands. Your personal fortune, or lack thereof, is really no more than an electric record of numbers held in some distant database. Depending on the prevailing winds, Stocks in 401ks rise and fall with global economies. Depressions and recessions can make millions of dollars simply evaporate. And nothing's certain, except for the degree of uncertainty when it comes to the global house of cards we call the economy. To be sure, debt's a drag. And many of life's pleasures do require money. However, this needn't keep anyone from playing. 
This is not to suggest that reckless spending is the path to happiness, but neither is penny budgeting. Budgeting spreadsheets, they're no fun. Even a little nest egg never hurt anybody, but when excessive frugality begins to infringe on your daily enjoyment of life, it's time for a little adult play. If you're going to save money, fine. But don't forget to set aside some for a little indulgence for yourself. As the old saying goes, you can't take it with you. isn't always easy to come by, but in your current circumstance, budgeting is required at least add a line item to it for a little splurge for yourself now and then. It could be very grand, like a tropical holiday. It could just be dinner out at a new restaurant. Or it may just be renting a favorite movie. But regardless of the scale, you owe it to yourself. So spend that cash. Don't feel guilty. Remember, it's your duty as a good citizen to help maintain the economy. One of the greatest pleasure squashers in today's society is the current obsession with health, longevity, dieting, and body fat reduction. In the current climate of carbohydrate demonizing, calorie counting, and food fascism, it's estimated that one in every five Americans is vigorously adhering to a fad diet of some sort at any one point in time. It's perfectly natural and really quite practical to want to look and feel good. That's fine. And to remain fit, even better. But to live under the delusion that zero body fat will bring you happiness is laughable at best. Sure, it's great to be thin. You can wear better clothes, and you get better attention, and more of it. Granted, if you suddenly gain 100 pounds, your desirability on the open market may sink fairly dramatically. But a few pounds here and there will really make no difference whatsoever. The assumption that everyone's monitoring your physique against some imagined standard of perfection is indicative of a massively inflated ego. No one cares if you have dessert now and then. No one notices when you gain two or three or four pounds. And if by chance there's someone in your life who does notice, who's keeping track and making comments about it, it's not your eating habits you should be concerned with so much as your choice of friends or lovers. As we've seen time and time again, those who enjoy the pleasures that life has to offer not only live better, but sometimes they even live longer. Just a few examples to convince you. Pablo Picasso lived to be 91 years old. Picasso spent a lifetime dedicated to his art and to expressing his inner self, both his dark and his light sides. Throughout all of his life, Picasso was a compulsive smoker, drinker, and an incorrigible womanizer. He lived by his own rules, thumbed his nose at convention, and never gave up any of his favorite vices. 
He died in style at the age of 91 while hosting a dinner party in his home. George Burns lived to be 100 years old. Known for his trademark cigars and deadpan humor, Burns often joked about performing on his 100th birthday. The likelihood that George Burns would live to see his 100th birthday became a running gag in his stage show, but he indeed intended to live that long. He even booked himself to play the London Palladium as a 100th birthday celebration. However, his health seriously declined towards his centenary, and although he eventually reached it, he was too ill to perform any engagements and died just 49 days later. His life's work was all about laughter, and it kept him going for a full century. And through it all, he never denied himself his favorite pastimes of drinking, smoking cigars, and ogling young women. lived to be 102 years old. England's <coughs> beloved Queen Mom actually led a complicated life. She lived through several wars, there was political turmoil, and the premature death of her husband at the age of 51. But a wry sense of humor, a love of horse racing, a tendency toward bank overdrafts, and a passion for drinking kept the lady monarch in good spirits throughout. She was very well known for her love of gin and tonics on most mornings. To celebrate her 100th birthday, a cake was served with her favorite icing made of gin and sugar. So living a life of self-restraint doesn't guarantee a long life. In the cases of Pablo Picasso, George Burns, and Queen Mother, seems that each was keenly in touch with how to have pleasure and play in their life. Life may have presented them with times of great stress, but their natural instinct was to create their own times of pleasure and enjoyment, which in turn most likely ensured that the turbulent times were well balanced with equal times of their own unique kinds of In conclusion, as the morphine drips slowly through the tubes and the blurry, smiling faces of family and friends look lovingly upon you, there will come a moment in which it all becomes vividly, unquestionably, and inescapably clear. The choices that you made determined your path. The opportunities were there and the ultimate direction of your life was in your own hands the entire time. A sad ending is not inevitable. Regret may not accompany you to the other side. 